organizers again for this invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here and in a place that's so dedicated to play and improvisation and experiments. So um, um, this, I offer you this, um, and we'll see how it goes. Okay. So I have to start here, um, which is uh, the recent US election reminds me how much pleasure I take in breaking things. <laughs> and it makes me want to break even more things. Each day we survive in the aftermath, even here within spitting distance from this Trumpified America, I am more and more committed to finding any way I can to lend my hand at dismantling toxic white masculinity and heteropatriarchy, to disrupting colonialism, to shutting down racism and white fragility, unhinging militarism and tripping up capitalism, I'm also really bent on exposing um, human exceptionalism and making strange this stupefied, consensual sensorium that leaves us slumbering and numbed as we scroll seamlessly through self-same me social media feeds. It has never felt so urgent to detune our sensorium, to disrupt this consensus, and commit to a kind of dissensus that finds us attuning otherwise. So what I want to share with you today are some of my ongoing efforts to disrupt and unsettle the sometimes tacit and sometimes explicit logics shaping speculation about pasts, presents, and futures of life on this planet. To do this work, I'm working here in High Park, Toronto's 400-acre pleasure park, um, featured here in this old uh, satellite image. Um, the speculations about pasts presence and futures I'm concerned with here center around a remarkable and rare oak savanna ecosystem, a nature culture 10,000 years in the making, which is currently undergoing significant ecological restoration efforts. What I feel most compelled to disrupt is the non-innocence of ecology and environmentalism. And so here, what I feel really compelled to break are the capitalistic, middle, militarized, and colonial logics that are foundational to the ecological sciences and ecologi the ecological stories getting told here. This project treats ecology as suspect for its sometimes quiet and sometimes violent complicity in colonial and neo-colonial projects. And I'm especially wary of stories that performatively reiterate and sediment um, uh, stories that instrumentalize non-human life as use values and commodities, and which reduce life to metrics of reproductive fitness and energetic efficiency. I'm particularly concerned with the functionalisms that render nature in the form of ecosystems services that calculate energy expenditures. If ecological facts are crafted in fields of power that reproduce everything that is wrong in the world today, and I want to do ecology otherwise. And this talk describes my initial efforts to invent robust forms of knowing and not knowing that can stand athwart and alongside the ecological sciences, pushing them to ask better questions while holding them accountable for their erasures, their whiteness, their colonial violence, and their extractive exuberance. I get the desire for scientific facts. For sure. I wrote a book on fact making in the life sciences. I was a practicing molecular biologist, trained in the plant sciences. Um, but you know, what I really want to bring home is that science is not what we thought it was. It is more and other than what we thought it was. And the protein modelers who build atomic resolution models of the chemical structures of protein molecules who I worked among as, a, as an anthropologist taught me remarkable things about the synesthetic, affective, embodied nature of scientific practice. Modelers tune their kinesthetic imaginations to protein form. Models and molecules become machinic and animal just as modelers become molecular. And in so doing, modelers practice a near shamanic art of shape-shifting. What the modelers who I worked among taught me is that objectivity is always already situated, embodied, felt, and relation relational. Rigor is more and other than routine, regulated, exacting, undistracted, and detached. It is also practiced as multiple forms of deep, abiding, careful attention. Rigor, for me, I learned, has more to do with passionate attachment 
than neutrality. And robust forms of knowing can be generated, I learned from these practitioners, from deeply sensory, sensual, and near numinous attunements to the excitability of matter. What I learned from these modelers is that their deeply intuitive feelings for molecular facts are transduced through their own excitable tissues that dance a molecular world into being. My ethnographic encounters with them revealed how scientists continually disrupt the self-evidence of what counts as fact, what counts as data, what counts as objectivity, what counts as knowledge. Um, and so this book that I wrote was about the failure of mechanism to fully disenchant the life scientists. It was about scientists' failures to adhere to the mechanistic, functionalist, neo-Darwinian logics that they think they're supposed to avow. So science isn't what we thought it was, and yet much effort goes into ensuring that the effective entanglements of inquiry, these passional al and alchemical arts, are kept a secret, especially from non-scientists. And so in the same breath as they articulate the desires and wiles of molecular affinities with their molecularly abducted bodies, <coughs> modelers will disavow these forms of knowing, holding on to the consensual scripts of science <laughs> as an art of detachment, neutrality, and dispassionate objectivity. So much effort goes into upholding science as a universalizing truth maker that in nearly every domain of social, political, and economic life, science is given full reign to level, colonize, cannibalize, and destroy other forms of knowing. Claims to science are claims to forms of knowing that institute hierarchies among life forms and separate humans from nature. They're claims that mechan mechanize and commodify living processes and silence local and especially indigenous knowledges. And so my new work holds out for ways of knowing and not knowing that cannot be put into service of bolstering science's power. And so I'm really um, moved by the call um, here of sort of illegible, um, unuseful, um, uh, illegitimate data forms. Um, so I'm kind of excited about that. So doing ecology otherwise, this requires for me unsettling the foundation, founding logics of the life sciences, breaking their tenacious affinities with neo-Darwinism, capitalism, and colonial expansion. And simultaneously, um, it begins with what the modelers taught me about synesthesia, intimacy, love, care, and desire as the conditions of rigor and objectivity. So this is sort of a preamble to, sh um, to, to set the stage for what I want to share with you today is what I tentatively call an ungridable ecology. So we're missing some of the text here, it doesn't matter. Um, an ungridable ecology, which is maybe right, <laughs> we don't need to see all the text. Um, I begin with the assumption that is entirely, um, an assumption that is entirely blasphemous within the life sciences. I begin by breaking the well-worn consensus that living beings are deterministic machines running genetic code scripts um, to ma minimize energy expenditures in functional, economizing, defensive relations bent entirely on seeking efficient means of survival and reproduction. So, not that. <laughs> <laughs> I begin elsewhere and otherwise in a world that is always already full of sentient beings. Okay, especially those creatures caught in those endless loops that we recently saw. But I want to say that those were sentient beings enclosed in worlds that could not let them be. Um, and so what I'm learning to practice here are the arts of attunement and transduction among subtle bodies involving them in what I want to call affective ecologies. So let's go to High Park. It's pretty close. <laughs> we could walk there. <laughs> if I could take you with me on a walk, I would start here on the park's eastern edge. This stone and metal gate at Parkside Drive and High Park Boulevard marks one of three entrances to the roadways that wind through the park. Just past here is another gateway. It is a living architecture forged by trees that have been holding forth for quite some time. The here that we experience now was a different here when these trees were young. They've been growing slower and more imperceptibly than the city has around them. I'm told that some of these trees could be old as 250 years dating back to a huge fire that swept through the region in the 1750s. What did the trees know? If we learned to listen, what stories could they tell? For the past year and a half, I've been experimenting with ways to take these questions seriously. I've been visiting the park daily 
um, and working alongside Ayelin Liberona, a dancer, filmmaker, and longtime friend, to cultivate modes of attention that might help us tune in to the deep time of these lands and the no natural cultural happenings shaping its present. I've been experimenting with techniques drawn from the arts, anthropology, and ecology to invent a more than natural history and a more than human ethnography up to the task of documenting a happening 10,000 years in the making. Interested and involved, I'm learning to do ecology otherwise, to expand and extend this all too human sensorium in order to find ways to pay attention to what matters to the land. What matters to the land? You might protest. To whom would we even address this question? And how, if there was a response, would we be able to sense and make sense of it? What is becoming clear is that it is stepping into these questions requires disrupting consensual and hegemonic notions of the senses sentience and sense-making. A, a rupture in Western norms of sense-making leaves us in a generative space, the space of not knowing. Perhaps it is time that we find ways to reach towards the unknowable, the imperceptible, the ineffable, and the numinous. Not with the desire to capture some truth, but rather to learn how to step into not knowing as an ethic and a practice not knowing what form a response could come in, not knowing what matters here, not knowing is not about cultivating ignorance or indifference, rather it is a capacious and humbling space that offers some refuge from the hubris of knowledge systems, like ecology, that, that are bound so tightly to hegemonic cultural norms, evidentiary regimes, and moral economies that dictate what is good, right, and true. Forgetting what we thought nature was, <coughs> forgetting how we thought life worked, forgetting too the naturalizations of mechanism that made us believe that living beings work in the first place, or that forests perform ecosystems for services, or that reproduction and fitness were the only valuable and recordable measures of a life. So Eileen and I are insist on asking what matters here precisely to push past these assumptions about what counts as proper forms of knowing and the proper objects of knowledge in both anthropology and ecology. This is an experiment in suspending our all too well cultivated disbelief in the sentience of other things and beings. I begin from the assumption that we are surrounded by forms of sentience that we have for the most part been trained to tune out and ignore. I want to insist that there are forms of life and death that remain unregistered, unsanctioned, and unregulated by the machinations of biopower um, that you know, whose forces gain traction most forcibly in worlds where nature is already figured as machine. Imagine for a moment that we inhabit a more than human world that is always already sentient, that this world full of beings, becomings, and processes of coming undone is pullulating with sensing and sensitive forms of life and death, and that these living and dying bodies are attending and attuning, caught up in dances with and athwart one another, composing and decomposing in responsive, repulsive, and propulsive relation. To be sure, these sentience may not be for us to know, there is a world of effectively charged chatter in the loquacious ecologies all around us, taking shape among creatures we may never see or know and who have nothing whatsoever to say to us. And at the same time, there are some sentiences among us who are calling out to us and who deserve a response. I'm thinking of the plant. Plants, after all, are the substance, substrate, scaffolding, symbol, sign, and sustenance of political economies the world over. They hold the sky up and the earth down, sticking it out through thick and through thin all these years. These trees here in High Park can teach us about endurance and modes of attention. All this time, they've been paying very close attention to this changing world. Each note of growth, each bud, each meristem and root tip is a center of indetermination, improvising, experimenting, and conducting daily inquiry into the play of light, gravity, and vibration. Worldly conjurers, these photosynthesizers both make and are made by the surrounding airs and soils. They both shape and respond to worldly rhythms and shifting climates. And what might happen if we reach toward them with an ethic of not knowing? This work in the savanna is teaching me, um, this work in the savanna aims to cultivate a decolonial, queer, feminist ecology, one that can keep pace 
with the ephemeral rhythms, temporalities, improvisations, desires, and pleasures of human and more than human creatures. It is a study of the affective ecologies taking shape among sentient bodies, and it requires transducing the creative, improvisational and fleeting practices through which lands and bodies involve themselves in one another's lives. Feminist historian Carla Hustek and I propose the concept of involutionary momentum as a supplement to neo-Darwinian logics. Involution helps us to tune into the affective push and pull among bodies. The affinities, ruptures, and meshments and repulsions among creatures constantly inventing new ways to live with and alongside one another. In our study of Darwin's pollination experiments and the attunements of present-day chemical ecologists, we asked, what if the topology of ecological relations were conditioned not by a calculating economy that aims to maximize fitness, but an effective ecology shaped by pleasure, play, and experimental propositions? Were, where evolutionists tend to fetishize e economic logics, random mutations driving generational change, and functionalist accounts of adaptation, we sought out the involutionists who told stories about the fleeting and contingent forms of life happening now and now and now. Involutionary so stories unsettle notions of the natural fixity of species boundaries and normative accounts of sexual reproduction and sensuality. They begin from the promise that plants and other creatures are up to stuff, that their responsive sensing bodies are always already sentient. So one of the most important things that we are learning is that we can't ask these questions about what matters to these lands and bodies without asking first what matters to the indigenous people who tended these lands for millennia before the land was stolen, sold off as acreage, and later cordoned off as a municipal parkland. And so this is a map of um, John Howard's colonial moment um, of the takeover of this parkland. But the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe nations lived here. Many other indigenous peoples moved through this region, which was an active center of trade. Um, this region is close to the Humber River, which traced a route known, known as the Toronto Carrying Place Trail, a major traveling and trade route that tracked along the Humber River Valley watershed between Lake Ontario and what is now known as Lake Simcoe to the north. These, the issues of indigenous um, pasts and presents and futures are especially pressing today as High Park becomes a site of intensive ecological restoration where naturalists, ecologists and the city's urban forestry team attempt to bring back an ancient oak savanna that used to stretch out across these lands. These practitioners are appropriating and contorting indigenous land care practices as they do things like administer controlled burns. Their restoration efforts build on conventional ideas about native invasive species, um, ecological restoration, and proper ecological re relations. And in so doing, they tend to hail an imagined past that assumes there was a time when this land was in some state of nature, some natural state. For many, this is a nature composed of a pleasing array of plant life, a tame and picturesque nature cordoned off for leisure. Somehow that seems <laughs> really problematic. I have no idea where I am. Mm. <laughs> Leisure is not what this place is about. So this is a place of livelihood. This is also a nature that has been severed from its entanglements with indigenous lives, past and present. It's a nature that attempts to invisibilize the violences of settler colonialism by celebrating colonial histories of environmental stewardship. Settler colonial legacies have coded and continually recoded this land as a site of natural wonder, not cultural history, and their stories are colonizing both the pasts and the futures of this land. These attempts to save the oak savanna's nature have the strange effect of erasing the rich cultural histories that gave this land its contours and significance. And so here, ecological restoration efforts participate in an ongoing colonial project that has enforced the dispossession of indigenous peoples from their lands. It strikes me that those who desire to dream a future for oak savannas ought to be able to dream a past, present, and future that includes indigenous peoples. 
Indeed, these lands might teach us how to do ecology as if it were allied to the resurgence of indigenous peoples, not their continued oppression. As a white settler learning how to be an ally to indigenous resurgence projects on these lands, one thing I can do is support efforts to push up against the colonizing logics of ecological science and restoration ecology to expand the utterly constrained discursive field to make room for other ways of knowing indigenous and otherwise. If the sciences of ecology and ecological restoration themselves legacies of settler colonialism are ill-equipped to grapple with the past, present, and future of indigenous peoples, then we need to learn how to do ecology otherwise. Decolonizing ecology may render this practice unrecognizable as a science, and perhaps that is precisely what is required. We need to cultivate robust forms of knowing that can push the sciences back to ask better questions, to reorient their attentions, and unsettle their grounding truths. So High Park has the feel of other metropolitan parks, like Central Park in New York City. But there is at least one important difference. Central Park was built on land that Frederick Law Olmsted raised and terraformed to sculpt into an aestheticized woodland formation. As much as High Park's grounds have been sculpted by roads, athletics infrastructure, commercial enterprise, lawnmowers, and ornamental gardens, a good proportion of these lands retain their ancient forms. Oak savannas are old lands. This small swath of savanna by Parkside Drive that are returned to again and again is thought to be about 4,000 years old. There's one special place just north of the gate here, right on the edge of the park overlooking Parkside Drive. <coughs> For the past few years, I've been coming to this place almost daily. This mound has a magnetic draw that pulls me right up its steep slopes every time. From the top of this mound, you can see the smooth, undulating topography of Oak Savanna lands rolling out to the south, west, and the north. And you can look over the city streets and homes that line the park to the east. If you want to tune in to the deep time of this space, it's possible to just do this by looking down. Kick your boot into the sand. When you start looking closer, everywhere you look, you find sand. These lands used to be the bed of an ancient lake. 10,000 years ago, all this was underwater. Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Huron, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, the St. Lawrence River. The lakes and rivers that we know today used to have different contours. They used to be much bigger, and at times they were much smaller. This was a landscape of what um, John Riley calls the shifting drowned and emerging shores worked and reworked by water and wind, unquote. Lakes rose and fell while lands rebounded, released, at, released from the weight of retreating glaciers. And still, some of what is submerged today in Lake Ontario used to be above water. Water in its myriad form, frozen, liquid, and gaseous states is just one of the elements that has sculpted this landscape. Another significant elemental force shaping these lands over millennia has been fire. Oak savannas thrive in the sandy dunes of ancient uh, lake beds, but, in the but the widely spaced trees, open canopies, and prairie grasses that make up savanna ecosystems are ephemeral. Their transitional ecology is always on their way to becoming forest. Oak savannas need fire to keep the shade-loving forest from encroaching, <coughs> to stimulate the germination of oak seedlings, nourish the soils, and keep the seeds of prairie wildflower, wildflowers and grasses awake and active in the seedbed. The rhythms of combustion and decomposition in these landscapes are bound to the combustive and disruptive rhythms of fire. But fire is not just a natural force. Fire is integral to culture and practice. People around the world use fire to sculpt their lands. The stories that don't get told, and I want to understand this, you know, they also don't get heard even as they are getting told, um, are precisely those that keep um, of the deep cultural history of this land, not its natural history. According to the archaeologists, there were people living in this region before the ice arrived, as early as 14,000 years ago. The stories told by the, by the descendants of these peoples attest that they have been here since the beginning of creation. One of the many devastating legacies of settler colonialism in this region was the suppression of fire. And it wasn't just that settlers suppressed the natural rhythm of fires set by lightning strikes, they also suppressed the fires set by indigenous peoples who had long used fires to care for these lands. Eventually, the colonists suppress the very knowledge of these practices. Oak savannas like this one can teach us the fullest meaning of the concept nature culture. The oak savannas in High Park have endured for millennia only because they were cared for by indigenous people who deliberately and consistently used this fire to keep them open and thriving. 
Fire allowed the many groups who lived in this region to cultivate acorns, walnuts, butternuts, chestnuts, beech nuts, hickory, and hazelnuts. These nourishing trees in the open canopies of savanna lands attracted white-tailed deer, turkey raccoon, squirrels, passenger pigeons, and bears, making these spaces good, uh, good for hunting. The fires opened up spaces for people to build homes and villages and to grow corn, beans, and squash, sunflower for oil, and tobacco for ceremony. These lands were taken from the Mississauga First Nation in 1787 for a meager sum in a land deal that founded Toronto's predecessor, the town of York. The removal, the removal of indigenous peoples from their lands and the obliteration of their cultures through residential school systems and forest assimilations has and had and continues to have devastating effects on individuals and their communities across Canada. High Park's Oak Savanna provokes another line of inquiry into this history. Can we ask also about how this violence impacts the well-being of the land? What does a land lose when it's dispossessed of its people? What current ecological restora restoration projects reveal is that it is the nature of this land that has been deemed worth saving. And yet there is no space of pure nature to be found in an oak savanna. Savannas are nature cultures who ha whose happenings demand more than natural histories and more than human ethnographies to account for their deep time. This land is now coming undone. The oaks have been falling. <clears throat> They've been coming down fast. Seven enormous oaks have fallen since I started coming here daily last in the last years. The next generation, which have been grown up in thickets on sites that have been burned according to urban forest, forestry protocol, are just over 15 years old. In spite of the well-meaning efforts of the city's urban forestry team and the volunteer stewards, there is no saving the oak savanna. It is becoming other. Intensive ongoing efforts to restore the savanna through burns, plantation, plantings, weedings, and seed collection remind me again that you cannot take the people out of a savanna. New nature cultures are actively in the making. And as this happens, it is necessary to keep posing the question, what matters to this land? And whose cultures, whose natures, and whose stories will get to flourish into the future? We need protocols for an ungridable ecology in order to begin to ask these questions. Toronto's urban forestry team has put up signs throughout the park to mark monitoring plots where they've done ecological restoration work. <coughs> These sites are um, where workers have returned every once, uh, every once in every few years. And if you can read this, it's uh, this really old, decayed sign that reads monitoring plot. And I love this image here, which includes an invas the invasive species growing right up <laughs> and spiraling along <laughs> these uh, monitoring plots. But there's an archive at City Hall that contains uh, photographs um, where parks workers will come every couple of years and, and take and snap a picture. Um, and put that away in an archive, as they are monitoring this environment. But what is environmental monitoring? How is it being practiced here? And how could it be done otherwise? What other modes of attention might be required here? These are sites where it's clear we need to pay very close attention, but what, you know, what would we have to do with our bodies, imaginations, um, and our stories in order to learn to pay attention differently? <laughs> what modes of attention could change the stories that we tell. Becoming censor in this already sentient world, Eileen and I are experimenting with modes of attention to learn how to pay attention to this land that has been paying attention to all these transformations taking shape around it for so many years. At night from my house, just five minutes from this gate, I can hear a single motorcycle leaning into a curve in the highway, its engine rolling echoes off across the lake. Sound travels far here, it lulls, but it does not stop. And when the traffic does die down, I hear the drone of planes overhead more clearly. They can be seen flying over the park from Pearson Airport northwest of here almost continually day and night. Maybe it's all the noise and concrete and bustle of the city that propels me into this woodland. Though this is no quiet space cordoned off from the city, it promises another kind of rush and rhythm. The sounds of cars and trucks and planes are never fully muted. They just propagate differently here. There is no boundary separating city from park. Urban life from realms 
people still call nature, muffled and modulated by trees and shrubs, birds and squirrels and insects, ravines and slopes, city sounds resonate here in a distinct vibratory milieu. And these images of the kind of glass, metal, electricity, and petrochemical sliding by high parks, um, um, oak savanna, are precisely what needs to be included as we do a kind of ungridable ecology. These are integral um, participants in this ecology. The park generates its own noises too. There's a sandy hillside here where grasshoppers and dragonflies and wasps in high summer make such a din they drown out the drone of planes above. There are the barking dogs, of course, and then there are the dog people, who sometimes bark louder and more insistently at their dogs, calling out in voices alternately angry, insistent, or forlorn, a name or a command over and over again. And then there are the chipmunks with their shrill, shrill warning calls that come always with a shiver of movement, a rustle in the leaf litter, and the cicadas in summer sounding like electricity running along the wires. Sound palpates space and pulls at time, speeding up and slowing down the sounds of this land reveal voices from another time. Uh, my friend Nick Mura, a Barbados-born musician and co-founder of the Toronto-based uh, band Lal, taught me how to slow down a recording to the point that you can almost hear bird calls ricochet off the trees. His technique makes it seem as if echolocation is not the sole provenance of the big brown bats who deftly navigate this space at night. Following Nick's lead, Eileen and I started experimenting with sound during our first year of working in the park. We're coming to understand our experiments speeding up and slowing down sounds as modes of kinesthetic listening. And so we're both trained in, in dance and we both experience sound, though we're not you know, makers of sound, we definitely work with sound quite deeply. And so it's sort of one of these practices as a, as a mover where sound for me is so deeply in my tissues. I, don't, I have no sense that I'm actually hearing with my ears. So my fascia, my bones, and all my ligaments are actually part of this, um, this, this practice of hearing. And some of the ways that we work with sound actually feels like we are stretching and pulling at with the compositions, which is a really interesting way to participate in sound artworks. So we slowed down the cries of gulls flying overhead, finding ourselves calling up the sorrowful calls of coyotes sounding out into the night. When we slowed down a recording of Eileen's feet stomping a sound on a soundy mound, we were able to conjure the haunting sounds of ancient rocks crumbling by some massive geological force and the sounds of the earth quaking under falling trees. Speeding up the sounds of cars rush, rushing by allows us to channel the rhythms of the waves that once lapped at the shores of the lakes that covered this land. <clears throat> The sounding, these sounding experiments are teaching us about ways of conjuring pasts by playing with the elasticity of time. And weaving bef between folds in time, you're learning to ingather pasts into palpable presence. These kinesthetic experiments with sound are being coupled with what we're calling a kind of kinesthetic, kinesthetic imaging with light. And these practices are beginning to sensitize us to what, is, what this land is mattering and also what matters to this land. The kinesthetic images that I want to show you are, are really our experiments with learning how to pull light. And so we, one of the things we've done is, I mean, one of the things we're breaking is the sort of, is the camera and the function of the camera by holding open um, uh, the shutter, uh, changing the f-stop, uh, altering the ISO. We're, we're actually trying to see if we can do something different with, um, with the camera that would allow us to document the qualities and energies of what it means to be dancing with the light that is dancing with the trees that is dancing that are dancing with one another um, and so if traditional nature photography captures living bodies and turns them to objects of aesthetic and scientific scientific interest these kinesthetic images gesture to a different kind of account of the living world these images are attunements they are generated in the act of moving with and being moved by the beings and doings of a black oak savanna. As relational images, they document the energetics of an encounter, the push and pull between bodies. Rather than capturing phenomena, they, these images make it clear that it is a photographer who is caught, captivated. They are the ones who hitch a ride in what is becoming and coming undone. The rotting logs, frilled mushrooms, crumbling leaves, and ancient sands, and greening grasses are not discrete things. They are happenings, taking shape through deep time and in the ephemeral moments of now and now and now. It is the photographer who must learn how to keep pace with these rhythms 
through her dancing bodies. And so here I'm really interested in these images as part of an archive of um, illegible data forms um, for this effective ecology that documents intensities, desires, pleasures, and play. Um, a defunctionalized uh, archive of useless <laughs> um, facts, um, detuned from its functional logics, where we can still be in a nature that's that's uh, practicing its agency um, and learn to learn from these encounters as ways of kind of tuning in and constantly reattuning to these practices. So I wanted to share with you um, uh, a series of images and sounds that we produced uh, in the savanna, just to listen to some of the conjurings that we are playing with in this space um, uh, before maybe before we have a bit of a discussion afterwards. And we could maybe turn, I don't know if the lights go down at all anymore, if we need to do that at all. <coughs> Thank you. 
of silence and there's creaking and stuff like that. Did you compact a bunch of sounds or is that actually, are, are they layered sound after sound or did you have a lot of silence, kind of relatively silent gaps between those? There was no silence. Really? <laughs> really? In, yeah. in our recordings, there was, yeah. there was just no silence. Wow. I mean, we, so I mean, even at night? Mm. Uh, well, the, this particular recording was taken during the day in the spring yeah. at a time when the leaves are off the trees. So, oh, this, yeah. so this particular kind of sonic ecology in yeah. those spaces. Um, and the unend the the unending uh, traffic. So you, yes. there's never not there's never yeah. a lull, and there's never a lull in other varieties of things. So, but there are there's there's a tiny bit of layer. Like there's a tiny bit of layering okay. there. So okay. some because of the you, you were micing, I think your feet crunching in the leaves. And yeah. And yeah. There was a lot of mic. How many mics were you using? Um, we had one directional mic, yeah. um, which we offered. We're using also as in like uh, moving into the sound. Okay. So actually leaning like to so leaning into the traffic. Yeah. So going to changing our speed oh, in relationship to things that were coming towards us and just experiment. So it was our first experiment with sound. So it's just really, it was sort of like the pleasure of like seeing like what, yeah. what we might play with. with and the choreography of capturing the sound is kind of neat too when you're swinging exactly. into it. Exactly. Yeah. And so I do, what we're interested in is experimenting also because when you're, when we're, when we're practicing our sort of as movers in that space, yeah. the, um, the, the sense that there are, diff there are different worlds on either side of course of the bineural kind of moment. So so eventually we'd like to really experiment with what that what it means to listen as a dancing body in that space to to the to the yeah. sonic ecology that is taking shape through bodies that are so multiply diverse like distributed, right? Very interesting. Yeah. And can I make one more quick comment there? That it would also be interesting to do with the sound while you're doing with the image. The long you know where you're I don't know what what that would entail, but where it actually can you overexpose sound, you know? Mm. Can you actually, can you do the kind of, the blur them. of the sound, right? <laughs> yeah. To match the blur of the image. Yeah. You know, it's kind of neat. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. What I, I just loved it. I, it it's, was so resonant for me in many ways. But one of the things that really struck me is that I ceased to look at these beings as objects. Mm. Yeah. It kind of it, so it really for me the uh, the the striking thing was that it, I mean the object oriented kind of point of view also doesn't really capture what you did here too so I really it was very almost each each image was an ecology in itself <laughs> right so you have these enmeshed ecologies not objects I'm so glad you saw that. <laughs> <laughs> That, that was marvelous. So you know, thank you. Um, but I'm I'm curious, what the, the what is the role in this affective ecology of fear, dread, or anxiety? Huge. <laughs> That's huge. So um, I mean, I intentionally locate this project right at the edge of uh, a giant thoroughfare, right? So part of it is about um, being in um, an unrelentingly, like physically, like both sonically, but also energetically assaulted space. The entire park is, um, um, has been transformed into an infrastructure for stormwater runoff. Um, so the chemical violence in that space is pretty like abundant. Um, these you know, this is, these are just the very first sort of like senses of images, but to properly document this ecology means attending. So I spend a lot of time documenting the garbage. I don't pick it up. I'm interested in what other people do with that garbage, but documenting the just, um, the erosion, the, dis the displacement, the, the all, and you know, what shows up in these spaces. There's this tree that someone decided to like hang you know, bags of dog shit, like, all over the tree. And I was like, okay, this is really interesting. I'm just going to, this is amazing. Um, but to me, um, to me, absolutely, those those emotions are, are really poignant. And as an anthropologist, I really care about how, what people make these spaces mean and how people confront their own anxiety. So I take people on sensory tours of this space and make them confront the traffic, like, the, you know, and no one 
deals with it well, mm-hmm. and that's the point. Um, and so part of it is not to not to reproduce the boundaries that imagine us separate from these spaces, but to to help us register that these spaces are incredibly porous to. Um, you know, extractive fervor <laughs> and um, on all those logics. And so telling stories that hold on to those violences without romanticizing this, um, um, the present or the past is nature, part of, part of understanding it as a nature culture as well, yeah. I just wonder if you could speak a little bit more explicitly about the heretical valences of your work just in relationship with the institutions that you've been critiquing. And especially just because I, I mean, I see your work as thinking through the entanglements of tech, techniques, aesthetics, I mean, what Karen Bride might call a response ability mm-hmm. to the complexity mm-hmm. of the world. So I, maybe you could say just a little bit about that, how, maybe how you use techniques, how that's part of the ecology of concerns yeah. and how that actually feeds back into how the workings and the unworkings of techniques feed back into the way that you, you access that world. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, by techniques you mean like the instruments we're using? Yeah, all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a, a real sense here that um, you know, our machines are not the enemy, <laughs> but but that they can be reappropriated and done and remade in interesting ways. But um, but that we um, and I'm very much um, you know schooled in the in the sort of um, the frame of a feminist science studies kind of um, uh, which is you know grappling with the non innocence of our of our interimplication with these machines, but also holding us accountable for the stories that we mm-hmm. come to tell through them. And so the question of accountability and the question of the kinds of um, the our our will to make ourselves available to respond, um, which is not to always act and not to always care in the ways that might involve like particular acts that we assume like let's let's fix this ecosystem but actually you know uh, to withhold in certain moments that are where you know that actually might be the better thing to do so responsibility for me is actually a really crucial thing that involved that um, you know begins in non-innocence and it begins in um, our complicity with all of the machine you know the machines that are part of this world and yet whoa we could tell these stories otherwise so we don't like and what i'm very committed to is recognizing those hidden logics so then i mean there's quite a bit of a human exceptionalism in stories that were told you know here and i was like oh it's like how do we call ourselves out for sort of some of those formations and how do we continue to hear that our our sort of um you know, the salience of neo-Darwinian stories that imagine some sort of, like, you know, formation of, like, you know, that and reproduce these ideas that organisms really are just their genetic code scripts. Those things are so imminent in our logics, and how do we just subtly break that enough? And I'm sort of really committed to that ongoing labor of recognizing and sort of amplifying, um, and then telling the stories otherwise, which is involves another creative work. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let me echo the thanks for your yeah. talk. Stones in the right word. It's actually more of like a line of flight. <laughs> wonderful. So really genuinely thank you. Um, this started as two questions, but I'm going to make it one. Okay. Um, and so maybe the question is, um, well, the set to the question is I was thinking about the relationship between the word ethic, protocols, and modes. So mm. ethic is not knowing protocols and ecologies and modes of attention. Mm. And, um, <laughs> And the, one of the questions I was thinking about was, um, as your protocols for the unregrettable ecology produce different modes of attention in the space of Hyde Park, um, are you finding uh, emergent modes of attention as well for spaces like this one, where you're viewing, mm. um, you know, you're viewing a kind of representational object which yeah. has this, this this strange frame? And so, I guess what I'm really curious about, and maybe et- this is where ethics comes in, is to what extent are those modes specific to the sites in which uh, they're cultivated through protocols? Mm. And to what extent um, do the, does the mode of attention cultivated by this amazing audio video presentation uh, relate to the modes of attention cultivated by dancing with right. plants? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I feel hamstrung in spaces like this because really I just want to take you with me. <laughs> um, and so um, for me it's um, absolutely like to tell people about, oh my, like, oh, I had this experience and it's really great. <laughs> Versus, um, so one of the things that we do is not tell people what they're supposed to experience in these spaces. And so we take people on these sensory walks and give them space to come to their own, right? So in our um, 
our kind of building an archive of an ungradable ecology involves all of these these amazing materials that people are generating in the space as they come to do that. And so for me, that's a, a much fuller experience where you know we can give um, offer people sort of a guided visualization from which they open up their eyes, and the trees are not the same. Like the trees are pulsing, moving, dancing beings, like having experiment, like conducting experiments, and like and so and people can see that, and then they can go like, oh wait, wait, what's here? And we send them off, and they do. They do some environmental monitoring in whatever mode of attention that they've invented to like figure out what they think matters here. And so for me, it is a very much an experiential process. And um, Eileen and I are struggling with forms. Of how do we relay this in broader forms? And so um, it is, you know, we we're like, I want to literally was like, we I would like to show people pictures and share the sounds at the same time. So we literally threw a <laughs> clip together, you know what I mean? Yeah. Versus like how more mindfully do we want to reproduce this? And so there's some ideas about how, how we might create installations that, uh, that, that produce the kind of sense, the kinds of sensing that we're interested in cultivating. And for me, I'm just really committed to people <coughs> sensing the world differently. And that is an experiential practice. So is it fair to say that the, um, different, the different ways of sensing the world are ways that are actually uh, specific to this this particular nature culture, um, rather than just difference for difference sake. Is right. that right? Is that yeah. Right? Well, for sure, for sure. And actually, this, so this is a land based, a place based project, a land based project that is um, <coughs> um, trying to learn how, what matters there. And so it's um, part of it is learning to be resp responsive to what it demands. And sort of, I, I really think um, that an ethic of responsibility is about like you've got to invent whatever you need in order to learn how to pay attention here. And that 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 is about here, and that uh, you know absolutely in other spaces we would, yeah, need to cultivate other yeah. Uh, thank you again. Um, just two two questions. One really quick. Uh, the first one: How far down do you take sentience? Just because that's that the term that you used, and yeah. It, yeah. different people have different ways of understanding yeah. uh, what that means yeah. and how far it extends, yeah. how it scales, right? Uh, the second one is uh, in, in to understand. <laughs> A kind of ecological frame. Um, do you do you know Jim Coetzee's book, The Lives of Animals? No, I um, no no. Yeah, so there, the, yeah. the, there's a critique in there by an author who he portrays himself <coughs> as uh, Elizabeth Costello, and she sets up this uh, idea that that we can sympathize with animals through poetry. Through mm -hmm. uh, artists. she's a she's a fake fictional writer uh, who writes her way into writing uh, Marian Bloom. The alternate story to Ulysses, and she says, this, "I can imagine my way into this, just like we, why can't we do that with animals?" Mm. Anyways, but she then has this this strange, um, counterintuitive sense of ecology is uh, to be understood that animals, she's speaking about animals, have no interest in knowing that the gnat is not no less important than the salmon, um, or the idea of a salmon or a gnat. And all they care about her is their individual survival. So there's, she says, this ecology is not a harmonious uh, ecology. It is one that is violent of, upon uh, others in the in the name of preserving your own belt. Their own belt, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I mean, that, I just wondered if you'd heard yeah. that. Yeah, uh, and that's uh, precisely the story that I yeah. want to go against entirely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. as if we knew. Um, as if we knew what survival was, as yeah, if we sure. knew what a life was about, as if we knew what they were up to in any of these contexts. Like, I want to start from not knowing, yeah. precisely. But I also think that we, um, so sentience for the molecular biologists that mm -hmm. I worked with was in the freaking proteins. Like, yeah. they were dancing around and had desires and wiles, and they were happy and sad, and they felt things, and they had affinities. And so for me, I really, I think with Merleau Ponty here that, you know, mm -hmm that sensing is the promise of sentience, mm. that the capacity to sense is the promise of sentience, mm -hmm. and that it, that, cel that cellular, so a lot of the life scientists are kind of grappling right now with a kind of cellular mm. sentience, mm. a kind of, at the level of cells, um, cells have the know-how. Okay. Proteins are up to stuff, folding and unfolding, experimenting, right? And so it's a very, it's, it's, um, it's an undoing of all, everything we've ever learned, mm -hmm. right? About um, the automata mm -hmm. <laughs> of, of cellular machinations. And what, what, I'm, what I've unearthed in the work is trying mm -hmm. to find, oh, these, the, the way those metaphors of molecular machines are, get naturalized to the point that we believe them, mm -hmm. rather than see them as salient stories, as visualization tools from opening up worlds for us. And so for me, the, the, we, I mean, I will allow for, um, 
you know, matter. Matter mm-hmm. for me is excitable. Mm-hmm. And that excitability is entangling and it's and stories get shaped between mm-hmm. bodies, right? Stensiences are not also in, 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 um, innate in bodies, but also shaped between in relations. So I'm interested in those. Uh, those. And so for, uh, for me, any, um, I'm, I also sort of, I work on plant sentience and there are all kinds of ways that we could learn how to meet the sensorium of a plant to start to learn how it's sensing, we could actually, I mean, our morphological imaginaries are incredibly plastic. And so imagination helps us get to the possibilities of feeling alongside other creatures. Um, but we have to be very careful not to import, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. We need to detune our <coughs> consensual sensorium to our meet that. Yeah. Do, do you make a, dis- just a quick follow-up, make a distinction between sentience and mentality? I wouldn't use the word mentality. I yeah. guess cognition and mentality like aren't even. Yeah, I'm not interested. Yeah, I'm not interested in mind per mm-hmm. se as a kind, a very bodily. I'm really interested mm-hmm. in the bodily uh, senses. So the, the idea that like skin is sen- is sentient. Okay. The idea, yeah. So um, the mental space is not. No, that's the whole thing. So the vegetal, the vegetal is great because we get to this <clears throat> this headless creature. Right. We don't need this headless creature who can root and do all these incredible things in really creative ways. Yeah. I'm um, weirdly hesitant to actually follow up on this question because I'm, I'm really loving this idea of plantings and this way of thinking ourselves in the world that is outside the exceptionalism. Is there, a, and I, this is a sincere question, is there a hazard though of taking that degree of how deep you go with sentience in relation you know, to that molecular level? Is there a danger if we apply that back to human bodies and agency over? our own bodies and those that we may or may not want inside of us. <laughs> so I'm thinking about reproductive rights. Yeah. And how yeah. is there a flip side to this? Like yeah. how do you Well I mean eating, right? Life. Eating. Like yeah. to make an argument that a plant is sentient is not I mean helps us realize that sentience isn't the re- like we don't discriminate like we shouldn't be discriminating about food based on sentience, right? So like, if everything is sentient, obviously what we choose to eat isn't about whether it's sentient or not. We should be asking for permission to eat anything. <laughs> and so our decision to have, a, you know, ha- have or not have a child isn't about whether it's sentient or not. Right? Is I mean, isn't about that. It, that's not. That's not. It's whether a mother would like to have a you know person with woman would like to have a child or not. So I mean, the the deci- the idea that um, the idea. I mean, matter has a kind of deeply um, excitable way of being in the world, and bodies grow and you know do all kinds of amazing things that you know. But when we start to understand the creativity, I mean, really interested in the creativity of growing and beings that are that gets under. Um, and, and the kinds of impoverished models of um, non-sentience that end up overcoding all of this and give us dead life. And so, I, I, so I, I think it's okay to have a world that's already always sentience and recognize the violence of all our decisions mm-hmm. as we take those, dis, you know, the responsibility again. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to, to go back to this question of the. It's actually I'm not looking for a clarification of something. It's a very interesting moment for me, and I, I may have heard this wrong. So you can just say no, that's not what I said. Um, that's fine. Um, so there's a relationship between the question of sensation and the question of sort of more old-fashioned sort of idea of aesthetic imagination in a certain sense. And I love this idea of you know like sort of transformation in imagination can sort of produce. So that that moment, uh, did I get this right? So the moment where you were kind of like saying, um, all right, so we made these sounds, you know, which we can make now, and by sort of processes of manipulation and sort of transformation, um, they would be like sounds that no longer exist um, in the environment. So I was kind of thinking, you know, that's nice because you're using something that's already there to make something which is no longer there in terms of the sound, right? So what I was thinking, I mean, it's sort of slightly a thought experiment a little bit, just like, well, did you need to make it with the sound that was already there in order to create the aesthetic, you know, transformation, the aesthetic imagination? Do you see what I'm saying? Because there's a, you're using the actual material sonic stuff that's there, but it is for a sound which is literally no longer there. It's not like we can, yeah. you know, on yeah. that level, according yeah. to what I was hearing. So yeah. I was wondering about that use of the materials that are mm. already present, mm-hmm. like through the, the imaging and, mm-hmm. and the sonic stuff, with regard to this project of transformation in the imaginary and whether the materials actually do have to come from the place or whether you could transform the imaginary 
I mean, you could do an electronic music or something maybe, like maybe, that. So I'm interested, yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be resolved. Yeah. It's not a, like, if you can't resolve this, I don't like what right. you're saying. It's more like, um, <laughs> I'm just interested in that, because I think it's perfectly fine. So if I use these sounds yeah. to make something about yeah. the sonic environment, I'm just thinking yeah. it's in here. Yeah. Um, so, so what's that? Yeah. I mean, it's not necessarily a problematic yeah. gap. I see it as a practice of conjuring, which is nice. really, like, not, mm. like, the, the, like, there's something here, and can we play in this space to conjure another here, mm -hmm. right? And it isn't, uh, but it is about recording what's here. So I do, I am in, very much interested in taking the materialities of the world. And so I'm really interested in the practice of rendering, like, um, which is, which is the art and craft, like, of, <coughs> of pulling and bending at the world, like, tearing at stuff to, to, to pull it into other, <coughs> other forms and all kinds of aesthetic forms. And so the book that I wrote on rendering life molecular was about all these incredibly like complex aesthetic formations and technical maneuvers and all of these things of pulling and bending at the stuff of life to pull it into sort of human visibility. And I, I, there's a, such a creativity in the molecular biologist practice. And I'm really interested in like, what are we, what are we doing with these stories and how, what kind of, um, what kind of play and improvisation can we have with these materials to tell these other stories? And it's it's not um, it's it's to show also the fictionality of our storytelling at the same time. So we can start with what is here, and I'm I'm interested in what is here, and I'm interested in the sound of the stomping feet, mm -hmm. and then I'm also interested in this like what else is there? Well, the stomping feet is on sand. Oh, what is sa sand? Oh, time. Oh, so, you know, it looks sick. Mm -hmm. Oceans. Oh, yeah. So you get this like different quality. And so I do like, I want to be in the material as much as possible and play outside of that. Yeah. Um, you were talking about the age of the horse and stuff. And I, I for some reason, it was funny that uh, Johannes Fabian thought about that. And I was thinking about um, this idea of the forest being described as outside of history or in a different historical moment mm. because of its sort of inscrutability in terms of our ability to proceed in that same sort of mm. time scale. Right, like right. A, like a tree like phenomenology or something. Mm. <coughs> Which I guess related to Anne's question about, or a point about the de objectification of a plant uh, not working well with object oriented ecology. So I, I started thinking about what would an anthropology of non-human objects look like that didn't anthropomorphize the object in order to render it available to anthropology. Yeah. So you're an anthropologist. Yeah. How, as an anthropologist, do you approach the non-human without making it human enough yeah. to say something about it from the perspective of an anthropologist? So great question. Um, I actually uh, don't think we know what anthropomorphism is. And in fact, I think it's misrecognized in all kinds of ways. So um, the, I'm really interested uh, in the morphisms that go on every time that we play with language to make sensible some other world. And I want to make I make the argument in the book and elsewhere that what's going on are metamorphisms. That in fact, um, the scientist who's modeling a molecule as animal or wily or human or machine is simultaneously being molecularized. Their tissues are being molecularized. And so the, there is no one-way loop or one-way directional imposition of the human on the other. There's an ongoing remaking of the human in these entangled relations as the object changes. So the morphic quality here is really uh, ex um, um, expansive, and so you. Um, so I, I actually am not worried about anthropomorphism. In, in fact, some of the scientists I work with was like, I don't, I don't anthropomorphize. I phytomorphize. I get my graduate students to dance like plants to figure out how to be like what a, pro a plant problem is, so that they, you know, and so there's a kind of um, a practice of yielding to the other, um, which is really crucial in the arts of crafting analogies that to tell stories in different ways. And so there are terrible anthropomorphisms, you know available for, for us to reuse and propagate, but there are also forms of telling stories about plants that don't assume such a radical bifurcation, right? So there's some interesting ways in which I'm interested in expanding our morphological imaginaries, right? What could we, how could we vegetalize our sensorium, precisely, in order to learn to attune to plants better? And we could actually learn to do that. I photosynthesized before, it's pretty fun. And so, you, know, and so you, can, you can do these, you can do all kinds of um, kinesthetic experiments. Um, to, to detune our sensorium and actually, and that will change the language we use. And so right now I'm watching plant uh, scientists, um, they, will, they are importing impoverished um, problemat 
problematic cognitive uh, behavioral ecology concepts onto plant worlds, um, but I'm in conversation with them in ways to encourage them to find ways to experiment to such that, you know, how could we begin with plant sensing um, and change human models of consciousness? By doing so, so anthropomorphism is not, is more and other than what we thought it was, and I'm I'm interested in in that kind of metamorphic movement, loop, a very loopy flow between um, between um, us and others that 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 change what we thought was going on in that relationship. Okay, so um, um, I have a question about nature, if I may. Um, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> So of course there are there are places on the planet that don't have a history of human habitation. Ah, right. I argue with you. <laughs> well, and and I, and I want to see if this will be your response, right? Um, so I'm thinking of Antarctica, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking of the ocean, right? And the only kind of response that I've really seen to what I'm saying, right, is that what we should be looking at there is the history of human impact. Yeah. So with the oceans, for example, I mean, Atlantis notwithstanding, we never lived there, right? But we've always sort of been, we've been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. we've, so we've impacted it sort of very dramatically, right? In that, in that chemical way that you were talking about before. But then once we're talking about human impact, what we seem to lose <coughs> is that kind of specificity of the indigenous people's actually living on the land that you want to talk about when you're talking mm -hmm. about urban parks, right? Mm -hmm. City parks um, or national parks mm -hmm. or that kind of like terrestrial mm -hmm. um, model of wilderness, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't, that does and doesn't map so well onto a place like Antarctica or mm -hmm. a place like the ocean. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, I'm trying to formulate this question. I still don't have it, but I guess I'd love to hear you talk about that. I, I fear that when we go from, when we make that kind of like line to um, more and more abstract and, and, and less sort of human and form, no, this is all wrong. Let me start that again. I fear that when we, when we make that jump from uh, an actual sort of concrete, um, documentable history of human habitation to this kind of more science fiction-y, almost abstract idea of human impact on the chemical right. level, yeah. that we lose something here, right? And then I don't know how to sort of get back there. Um, am I making sense? I'm a little do you want confused. To take over? I'm a little confused, but I, I, I do want to say that I think that, um, like, I, I work on um, on sort of plants in general, like, and I'm interested in the fact that every single plant on the planet is enclosed in some way. It has, it is touched by humans in some way. Legal mechanisms, infrastructures, all kinds of ways in which our entire world is already enclosed. Every, including Antarctica, right? Like it's the mapping and the scientific work. So enclosures, I mean, we are, we have enclosed everything. Right. Um, and so there are ways, that they may be un, uh, un, you know, uninhabited environments, but I'm really interested in, in honing in on inhabited environments to look at their ongoing, like both, like both you, know, you know, how people have used these spaces for you know, deep time, the colonial projects that have shaped those spaces, and exactly what, precisely what is going on now, at, and as those spaces are being shaped now for for whose future. So I'm, I'm, I, I kind of, I, I think that one of the one of the deepest problems we have is this idea that oh my God, we have to, humans are, human, we humans are the problem. We've got to get rid of humans. Right. Um, I, I, I think of that as kind of ruin porn, that kind of like, you know, it's this kind of like the ruin porn where, oh, once the humans are gone, nature can flourish. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, the, you know, if capitalism, you know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. We try and write ourselves out of the story so quickly. It's like, no, I think we should figure out ways to take better responsibility. So human inhabitation and contexts where humans have lived and shaped a land for a long time, I think are really important spaces for us to argue for nature cultures everywhere. Nature culture is everywhere. It doesn't like, and so anywhere there's been, um, you know, uh, a, a, like a, a, um, a piece of litigation or uh, legislation has cordoned off any area. International waters, not you know, all of those things are regulated spaces, and those are actually inhabited and in weird ways. In not you know, or not inhabited, but they are enclosed and in so doing. But I do want us to figure out ways. Not, uh, not to imagine removing us as the solution, but actually figuring out ways to be, be 
alongside. So my interest is um, that we get ourselves out of the Anthropocene quite quickly, right? And reimagine ourselves conspiring with these other forms of life to do life in better ways. So the Planthropocene might be <laughs> an aspirational, not epo epoch, but episteme, right? In which we like, oh, wait a second, look at all these people doing, uh, you know, doing life better, hanging out, conspiring with the plants. And so there are ways of, you know, there are great models around us for us to explore. Yeah. Just at this moment, how would you add the notion of cohabitation? Cohabitation. Yeah, to this story. Cohabitation. Now, there are also these discussions of cohabitation instead of inhabitation. Oh, right, yeah. So, like, what do you think about it? Like, could we multiply the co? <laughs> <laughs> so that it's not just two, or like, so, um, inhabitings. I don't know. <laughs> Multiply somehow. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, conspiracy is a term that uh, Tim Choi has been developing, which has been such a lovely, a lovely way to think past collaboration. Uh, suddenly, collaboration started feeling really flat for me, mm -hmm. and so conspiracy. Yeah. <laughs> we need Bre to conspire. Breathing together. Yeah, breathing together. Yeah. Exactly. Tim Choi's work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one more question, maybe from Jackie. Thank you. It's very inspiring. Um, <coughs> a question. Um, with photographs, for me. Um, I'm wondering how many photographs did you make? <laughs> yeah, and how the moment you choose the ones you want to see, yeah. they just kind of begin the uselessness of them. Right. They enter the frame. Right? Yeah. And how do you talk about that? Yeah, lovely. That's a great question. And there's, these are uh, just a selection. Yeah. But almost every photograph we took, we wanted to use. Then so we just had to like choose some. <laughs> Um, but the um, and these ones actually we created um, so they the images were never meant to be shown um, in sequence they were initially we were like oh we created a sequence that was a just a giant panel of images um, and it was there was a there was a narrative flow in the story we were telling right so there was it's um, I, I take very seriously the the responsibility we have as storytellers. And what's so strange is that when we put that narrative flow of the sequence of the images on the narrative flow of the sound, which was a totally separate project, and we overlaid them here, I was like, oh, what's so weird. <laughs> of course, the magic of... Um, so, um, um, but these are selected, uh, absolutely are grouped. Um, and what, what they're serving for, um, what, as, a, as we develop these protocols, you know, one of the things we're thinking of, like, Developing this as 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 data. So as a data as a data pro generating project, the illegible data, we would um, if this was a study of light and the play of light. Oak savannas, uh, the the light qualities are uh, the light levels or the quantities are what the ecologists measure. We want to measure qualities, and so we would go um, maybe three times a day, and dance with the trees and the light in that space, taking images gather that, the qualities of light at this time of day, the qualities of light at that time of the day, the qualities, and all of the images generated, of course, would be data. The question is, you know, what's shared, what's shared, et cetera. So, um, and then we craft salient stories, but like all scientists and all <laughs> scholars, we're always telling stories selectively from the data. And I think um, to, to call attention to sort of the, the aesthetic formation that we're working with here is really important. So I thank you for that question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can we thank Natasha?